He's not happy, is he? Hello everybody and welcome to Monday's edition of the Chris Pritchard Cycling News Show. I think, like for the fifth week in a row now, what a weekend of racing. We'll get into all the details of everything that went off at the Tour of Flanders, both the men's and the women's race shortly. That men's, there's so much to dissect in that. On top of that, let's check out everything that went off in the Giro over the weekend. We had a time trial and we also had that one of, I think it's the, the first mountain top stage finish. I could be wrong, but I'm getting a bit confused. I think it was the first mountain top stage finish at the Giro d'Italia. Before we get into any of that, if you want to see something a little bit different, over on Cameron Jefferson's channel, he dropped a video with yours truly in it. The hardest 100k loop in the UK. Me and Cameron took it on last Monday. The weather was atrocious, made for a decent video, and I've got to say, one of the best rides I have done in a long time. So thank you so much, Cameron Jeffers. Link's down in the description if you've not watched it and you want to check out something a little bit different in the cycling world. On top of that, the Win Your Dream Bike draw has launched last week. We're giving away a Pinarello F12 if you've not done already. Don't waste any more time. Go and buy your tickets. If you forget, and we do the draw and you get annoyed because you're not in it, you'll be kicking yourself because you might be winning that Pinarello F12. The person out there now who's not bought his ticket or her ticket might think, all right, I'll just buy one. And then we end up phoning them up and saying, hey, Susan, you've just won a bloody Pinarello F12. You're going to be glad you did it. So get involved in the draw. It closes on the 28th of October. Right, and let's get on with the show. But before we do, make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit that like button if you've not done already. If you hit that dislike button, Go on, sling your oak. Right, let's talk Giro d'Italia. On Saturday, we had a 33.9 kilometer time trial. Going into it, as you'd expect, the two Ineos Grenadier time trial beasts in Filippo Garna and Rowan Dennis. They ended up taking first and second. Filippo Garna right now is on the form of his life. Current world champion, fourth stage win at this year's Giro d'Italia. Second TT stage win. You can't help thinking that over final individual time trial in Milan is going to be won by him as well. But an amazing performance by Rowan Dennis. Also, in third place was Brandon McNulty, a potential GC contender. He finished one minute and nine behind Filippo Garner and was the best of those GC contenders. Following on from him in sixth place was Zhao Almeida, putting in an epic performance. One minute and 31 down on Filippo Garner. The rest of the GC contenders were there or thereabouts in that top 20. But what it meant for the GC after stage 14 was that Zhao Almeida had extended his lead to 56 seconds ahead of Wilco Kelderman. Pale Bill Bow was in third. Brandon McNulty had managed to get himself all the way up into fourth position. And you can see all the way down in 11th there, Teo Gegenhart managed to increase his position by one. Jakob Fuglsang dropped a couple of places out of that top 10. Teo Gegenhart was three minutes and 44 seconds down after the time trial. I think the time trial on stage 14 lost its importance just a tiny bit as there was no real standout time trialists in the GC contention. We looked at it as a potential place where, where Geraint Thomas would extend his lead or potentially make up for lost time and you know be able to put a fairly decent sizable gap on the rest of his GC rivals. He ain't here anymore, so that doesn't matter. So it became about Filippo Garner and Rowan Dennis. Brandon McNulty had an amazing time trial, but essentially that time trial, although Jao Almeida managed to uh, extend his overall lead, didn't really create those time gaps that we potentially would have expected if, if Geraint had been there. I think all these riders now in GC are, are looking at those mountains in that final week to really make a difference in that overall GC. And one rider who'll be looking to do that was stage 15 winner Theo Gagan Hart. What an amazing performance by him. Yeah, I'm biased. He's an old teammate of mine. Whatever. We both rode for Scotland at the Connor Games. Wow. Anyway. The final stage going into the second rest day was 185 kilometres long. Um, the Italian Air Force decided to, to make it look fancy in that before the race start. Big group out of the front of the race, they got around, I think the maximum uh, gap was seven minutes between this uh, breakaway and the peloton. Uh, this breakaway was a bit upset that the movie star were trying to get two riders in there, I believe, but eventually they did. And then coming over this bridge into a right-hand bend, just bizarre crash, that one. No real reason for it. Uh, I don't really know what happened. Navarez, is that how you pronounce his name for Ineos Grenadiers? He went down, looked a little bit hurt. The brake started to uh, break up a little bit with 50 kilometres to go. Uh, Rowan Dennis was out there in front and then he decided to uh, to pick up the pace and, and do what he did on Alpe de Zwift that time and just um, 
smash yourself to bits up a hill. Turns out you can climb a little bit. The main GC group had started to get their act together. Some were working on the front and they managed to start swallowing up the rest of those breakaway riders and eventually Rowan Dennis. Tail Gagan Hart looking strong in there. Jao Almeida was looking strong in there. One rider who wasn't was Vincenzo Nebele. He ended up getting dropped on this, uh, this airpin here. And another rider that started to get gapped was Zhao Almeida out front there. You can say Teo Gegenhart and Wilco Kelderman. There was a rider behind him. I can't remember who that was now. Maybe Peo Bilbao? No, it was another somewhere rider look. Anyway, as we came into the finish, Teo Gegenhart had enough time to put his sunglasses on his forehead, point up into the sky, hold his belly because he was hungry, and take the stage victory. Cracking performance. I keep forgetting this kid's only 22 years old. Zhao Almeida managed to uh, stay inside that Malio Rosa but look what it's done to GC with Teo taking that victory. In terms of the top two, notes changed. Apart from Kelderman, is now only 15 seconds behind Almeida. Jai Hindley, he's popped himself up for Sunweb, 2 minutes and 56 seconds. It's team Sunweb, two riders in the top three. Who'd have thought it? Blooming heck. Anyway, look at that. Teo Gagan Hart moves himself up into four positions. Still 2 minutes and 57 seconds down, but that podium is in sight for Teo I'm, I'm going to predict he's going to get on the podium. However, if he can maintain this form after this stage into the third week, I think he might be able to win the Giro d'Italia now. He was looking on amazing form and he just seems to be getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Three minutes is a big gap though. Is Almeida going to crack big time? Are we going to see Kelderman cracking? Are we going to see Jai Hindley cracking now? There's still so many questions to answer. Are we even going to see a Giro? Now, I know a lot of people commented last week saying, stop whinging about COVID and it being cancelled. Negative, Nancy. It's not about being negative. It's just about being realistic as to what the potential outcome could be after we have our second rest day COVID tests. Now, if we look back to what happened last week, we could be seeing a massive influx of positive tests. We've got to wait and see. Like, we, There's no point assuming things. It makes an ass out of you and me. So we're just going to wait and find out exactly what happens with these rest day tests. But there is a possibility that it could potentially get cancelled tomorrow, today, whenever you watch this. I don't know. And that'll be a real shame because the racing's been amazing and it's only going to get even better in this final week. So we'll, uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed. I want it to stay. I want it to get to Milan. But who knows? Sticking with the Giro, one rider still in contention of a top 10 place is Rafa Micah, and he's just signed a new deal that takes him across to UAE Emirates and become a wingman for Tade Pogaccia. Talking on the deal, he said, I'm very happy to have been given this opportunity at this point in my career. I will work for Pogaccia when necessary, but I will also try to carve out chances for myself where I can. Well, Terreno Adriatico, uh, the Tour de Suisse, and also, uh, you know, Vel Volta Espana. I usually find good form there. In that sense, I'm not your typical Polish rider. I bloody love the East. I hate the sun, though. Micah going to UAE is a brilliant signing, especially for Tadej Pogacar. When he needs him, he's going to be able to call upon him, and he's probably going to be there towards the end of the stages, something we didn't really necessarily see that often at this year's Tour de France. So having a wingman like Micah could really just propel, like he needs propelling any further, but propel Tadej Pogacar to, uh, to a whole new level, making his GC success just that little bit easier, I guess. Next up, and let's talk about the classic of classics, the monument of all monuments this year. With Paris-Roubaix being cancelled, the Tour of Flanders was essentially the big one that everybody wanted to win. And what do we want to see? We want to see Mathieu van der Poel going head-to-head -head with Wout van Aert. And you couldn't have scripted it any better. Before we get into the men's race, let's take a look at what happened in the women's. 52 kilometres left to go in the race. The peloton had a 1 minute 33 gap to them and the leaders out front. That was soon squashed. Look at this, 40 kilometers to go on the something berg, smashing it to pieces. Two riders trying to get up the road at 36 kilometers to go. That break would 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 end with, with nothing. Amiel Lewis, Am, Amiel Lewis, Amiel Lewisic and, uh, and Marcus, they tried to get away. They ended up getting caught. By the big names, then it was uh, Annemiek van Vluten, Cecily Ludwig Utrup. She tried to catch on to the back of her. And unfortunately, it was Annemiek van Vluten and world champion Anna van der Bregen who managed to get themselves up the road. However, are they out for a Sunday ride there? Having a chat? Having a laugh? Yeah, we really stuffed it to them, didn't we? Yeah, they're going to be bloody knackered. 
Let's have him. I am up for that. Anyway, they eased up and the rest of the pack caught them. There was a pack of around 12, 15 riders, something like that. As they went on to the other berg, it was Lisa Brennauer out front, smashing it to pieces. Van Vluten was still in there. Utrecht Ludwig was in there. Sarah Roy was just getting dropped. With 14 kilometers to go up the Paterberg, it was Chantel van den Broek Black who put in the decisive attack. That rhymes. Everybody trying to chase down with Annemiek van Vluten on the front, but you knew it wasn't going to come back and eventually they would, uh, they would let Chantel van den Broek Black Away, on her own, 3 hours, 29 minutes, she took the victory at the Ronde van Vlaanderen. The sprint for second was won by Amy Peters, so a Bowles Dolman cycling team won to Lotte Kopecky for Lotto Sadal. She finished in third. Lisa Brennauer, fourth. Sarah Roy bridged the gap after getting dropped. She finished fifth. And world champion Anna van der Bregen finished down in 11th place. Now then, over in the men's race, Blumineck. 244 kilometres. The race had been reduced by, um, it was about 30 kilometres, something like that. I'm not, I'm not really sure why. But these six riders managed to put about eight minutes onto the peloton. While Van Aert had a crash during the middle of the stage, it appeared that he just lost concentration. That was just past the halfway mark. Luckily for him, he, um, he slid off onto some soft grass and he was quick back on his bike and... Uh, didn't suffer any injuries from that one, and he was right back in that group there. You can see 52 kilometers to go, 18 seconds the gap, but there's the uh, the remnants of that break, and eventually they got caught, and you can see there, just piling straight through him, Mathieu van der Poel. And at 45 kilometers to go, Julien Alaphilippe made a little move. Van der Poel was uh, quick to react to it, as was um, Wout van Aert, and that other rider, I can't remember his name now, Betiol? I know Betiol was in there eventually, but yeah, we got exactly what we wanted, what we bloody asked for. Matthew van der Poel and that wild card there, Julian Alaphilippe riding away from the rest. And there he is, Wout van Aert, catching those two riders. But then disaster struck as, ah, we'll talk about this one shortly. Um, Julian Alaphilippe ended up hitting the back of a motorcycle. Um, we'll take a closer look at that shortly. That was with 35 kilometers to go. That essentially put him out of the race and his glasses nearly got run over as well, which is... Highly frustrating if you have to pay for your glasses. But anyway, that left the two out front. Matthew van der Poel, Wout van Aert fighting for victory. Behind them, they managed to put a gap of around one minute into the riders with 13 kilometres to go as they got to the uh, top of the Paterberg. Is it the Paterberg that? I think it was. I don't know. Anyway, this sprint finish was the coolest I have ever seen anybody. If you watch that back in real time... Wout van Aert refused to go to the front. He never checked behind him to see how close the rest of them were getting. His eyes were solely focused on that finish line. And yes, he didn't win. Mathieu van der Poel took the victory. I guess it was just his confidence. He was just he was just so focused. It was amazing that he didn't he didn't do anything apart from just stare straight ahead. And van der Poel had to keep checking, looking, finding out what was happening. Obviously, he had one eye on the guys behind as well as um, as Wout van Aert. But when Wout van Aert went, see, as a sprinter, should have just let a little gap go, even just a, a a foot or two foot, two feet, just so he's got something to rush into. Because he was start as he attacked, accelerated. It was instinct like that that Van der Poel went as well. So they both kind of start accelerating at the same time. Now, if you're accelerating when someone else is accelerating and someone else is ahead of you. Science, in it, they're probably going to stay away from you, especially when you're as evenly matched as those two were. So if Wout is me giving advice to Wout van Aert, just ease off a little bit, just create that space. So you accept, you see accelerate into him. As as he's not looking, then even when he turns around, bang, then you're out the saddle, and he doesn't realise you're carrying that extra mile an hour or two mile an hour, so it gets you past him. And I think had Wout van Aert got past him or or even you know, half wheeled him, it could have cracked Van der Poel, but he clearly wanted that victory and it was exactly what we wanted. Hopefully, that beef is going to be squashed now. I think that um, it was a straight up race. Both of them are clearly, clearly more talented than everybody else in the world, especially me. And um, it's going to be. It's a magpie. Anyway, it might have been the first Titanic battle we saw between those two, but it certainly isn't going to be the last. And I'd pay to see that every week. 
Now, one anomaly that could have been there, that should have been there, that wasn't there because he ended up breaking two fingers was Julian Alaphilippe. He managed to get away with those riders in that breakaway that was essentially the selection to the race final. Uh, but he ended up running himself into the back of the motorcycle. Let's, uh, let's check that out again. Right, the motorcycle wasn't stopped. Now, the motorcycle rider is a very experienced rider. He's been doing this for 20 years, he said, and uh, the TV camera had said it was on the left-hand side, so they moved across to the right-hand side. Uh, one thing I will say about that is that the, the Shimano neutral service and that rider on that motorcycle that Julian Alaphilippe um, hit should have known that they were on the inside line of a curve. And I think this happened... Um, I think this happened recently at the Lincoln GP as well. Russ Downing ended up hitting the back of a motorcycle. I'm sure that was stationary. I'm sure they stopped at the side of the road. This one was still moving slightly, but obviously at a lot slower speed than the, the riders were coming at it. And it was always going to happen. I think Julian Alaphilippe was actually on his radio at the time as well, so he didn't have any time to react. And you can see Van der Poel, Wout Van Aert both moved out and, um, and exposed the motorcycle for Julian Alaphilippe. He didn't have any time to react. Um, so it's... It's kind of one of those freak accidents that, that you're surprised doesn't happen more often. But, I mean, let me ask you the question. Who would you blame in that situation? Yes, the motorcycle potentially shouldn't have been on the inside. But should Julian Alaphilippe been paying more attention? Um, should someone have given him a bit more of a fair warning? I don't know on that one. But, yeah, ultimately it brings his season to an end with two broken fingers. Um, I think his season was going to finish at, at Flanders anyway. But let's throw him into the mix there with a kilometre to go. But do you know what? Alaphilippe would have made sure that coming into that sprint, it wasn't a straight three-up sprint. He would have tried to potentially dislodge those two riders and go off alone, which could have played perfectly into his hands because, like we saw again, Vevelgum, neither of them were, were ready to, to work together and both of them were essentially happy to, to let the other one lose. So could we have seen that happen again or was it too much at stake for someone like Mathieu van der Poel, whose dad has won Ronda van Vlaanderen. Did he want to take that victory so much that he was ready to, and willing to work to bridge that gap to... I mean, we're talking things that didn't even happen here, but it's, it, it's just such a shame that we didn't actually get to see those three riders heading towards a finish with five kilometres to go. That would have been that would have been the icing on the cake. We got the cake. The cake was amazing. But to have had Alaphilippe in there, putting on that layer of icing on that cake would have just been magnifique. Anyway, Mathieu van der Poel, winner of this year's Ronde van Vlaanderen. I think we'll leave it there. I think we're pretty much caught up to speed with everything that happened over the weekend. We've got Giro kicking back off tomorrow. Potentially, uh, we might... I don't want to say... I'm just saying we might see a few teams, potential riders, potential staff members uh, being sent home after their tests come back positive. But let's, let's be positive that they come back negative. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you're not done already, please hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. If you've disliked the video for whatever reason, I don't know why you do that, hit that dislike button. Make sure you leave your comments down below, and I will see you Wednesday.